Hello, my name is Peter Hindley. I'm Chair of the Faculty of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists at the Royal College of Psychiatry. And I'm going to deliver a seminar that was part of a series of seminars given at the Royal College of Psychiatrists in 2014 about resilience, both resilience for individuals but also resilience for communities. Montaigne observed that the greatest thing in the world is to know how to belong to oneself. And in this talk I'll talk a bit about attachment, a bit about belonging, something about belonging and resilience in vulnerable groups, belonging in a therapeutic setting and belonging and social media. I thought I'd start off by telling two stories. One is a story from a patient that I had in my previous job and another story which is a story about the child of a friend. So Jeanette was a young woman who I knew in my previous job. I first met her when she was four years old and I knew her all the way through to when she was 18. She came from a very adverse background. She'd experienced a whole range of very unpleasant abusive experiences and she'd experienced frequent breakdowns of care. So I think during the period that I knew her, she had probably something like about 25 different care placements. The reason I think belonging is a useful concept in relation to Jeanette is that in fact, in the end, her outcome was reasonably good. She was able to find herself a place in a therapeutic community. She lived there for several years and left there to live in a fairly stable setting, living in a much more comfortable way than she would have when I first met her. I think one of the elements of the good outcome for Jeanette is that myself and the service I worked in stayed with her throughout this experience and was a point of contact, a point where she knew that she knew people, that she felt that she belonged. The other idea of belonging I wanted to refer to was a boy, a friend of ours, who's four years old and who comes to our house very often. Uh, I remember recently he came to our house, his parents were asking us to look after him and his younger brother and he arrived, he came down into our basement, he got the toys out, he started to play. He seemed to be immediately at ease, he seemed to immediately feel that he belonged in our house. And I think that sense that he felt that he belonged with us and belonged in our house made it much easier when his mum left and he stayed with us for the day and then we took him home. And I think he does have a sense that he in some way is related to our family even though we're not strictly family members. And that sense of belonging is important in giving himself a sense of security when he stays with us. So what I'd like to do is start off with a brief overview of attachment as a concept within resilience and then go on to talk about belonging. So you're probably all very familiar with attachment as a concept. It was first thought of by Bowlby. He thought about the attachment figures being primarily the mother, but not necessarily. Ainsworth and colleagues developed an experimental situation in order to test attachment patterns. It's called the strange situation test. And they observed three main attachment patterns initially, what's called an avoidant attachment pattern, a secure attachment pattern, and an ambivalent attachment pattern. And then later, as this work developed, Main and Solomon observed another attachment pattern, that's what they call disorganised. People have gone on to show that parental attachment style predicts infant attachment style, and that insecure attachment styles, those are generally avoidant, ambivalent, and disorganised, are said to show increased risk of later difficulties. Now, what is attachment? People think about the attachment figure as a secure base, somewhere that a child can feel comfortable with, that they feel they can explore and understand the world from, but also seek comfort from. Attachment styles vary according to the individual that the child is with, so there isn't an individual attachment style that a child displays. Attachment styles are fairly stable in the short term, but not so stable over the longer term. And essentially, in terms of the insecure attachment styles, it's the disorganised or D style which predicts late difficulties to a much greater extent than in the other style. And you can assess attachment in a formal way using tests similar to the strange situation test up until middle childhood. Peter Fonagy has suggested that developing a secure attachment in the first two years of life is a foundation for later healthy development. Now, secure attachment patterns are associated with particular styles of parenting. So what's called sensitive attunement, that's the caregiver's ability to really come alongside and feel what the child is feeling. Warmth and synchrony, or really making sure that you're 
rhythm is the same as the child, that you're working at the same level as the child. And more importantly, your ability to what's called repair ruptures. So inevitably, when you're looking after a child, you get things wrong. That might make the child feel a bit anxious or a bit upset. It's the ability to repair that that really helps to build the attachment. Means has shown that the ability to understand and think about the child, particularly infants, as having mental contents and having thinking about the world also helps promote secure attachment. Now I've mentioned the, um, the disorganised attachment style and that's particularly associated with caregivers' mental health problems such as substance misuse, depression, psychosis, but also with maltreatment of the child by the caregiver. Now, attachment is a very useful concept, but I think it's a relatively narrow concept. And so what I'd like to talk about now is about belonging. Belonging is thought of in terms of frequent personal contacts or interactions with another person. They're ideally positive, but they're generally mainly free from conflict and negative affect. You can think about it as an interpersonal bond or relationship, which is marked by stability, effective concern, and continuation into the foreseeable future. So these are things which are very long-standing over many years. And for it to work, it should be mutual, so something that's between two people. Baumeister and Leary have suggested that the decisive impact may be the perception that one is the recipient of the other person's lasting concern. I think belonging is different in the sense it relates to relationships with many different people. And those different people can be replaced over time. It's also something which develops over time. There's a gradually accumulating sense of intimacy and of shared experiences. It's also something about the things that we share together. And it can also be satisfied in many different ways. So I think that people don't only belong in a sense of their relationships to individuals or to families. They can also belong in a sense of belonging to an organisation. I happen to be an Arsenal fan. Or to where they live. I happen to live in Highbury or to certain groups. In the contrast, attachment is very much about an individual relationship to an individual. So I'd like to go on to just have a look at belonging and resilience and to think about how it might function. So I'm going to start off by thinking about belonging in relation to vulnerable groups. I'm going to talk particularly about a study by Schofield and Beek that looked at the concept of belonging in children who were in long-term foster care. So this was 53 children in long-term foster care. Assessments were carried over a period of three to five years. There were multiple assessments and multiple measures. And prior to the reception into this particular foster placement, the researchers looked back at the experience of separation, the experience of loss that they'd, they'd had. They also looked at previous experience of maltreatment uh, in various different forms. And what they showed was that these children did show quite high levels of emotional and behavioural disturbance prior to their reception into their foster placement and at the point at which they were initially placed within the family. They followed her up and they were able to follow the children up into their teens. One child in, the, in this study group had died and she, he had severe multiple disabilities. 75% were in stable placements. Eight had made constructive moves to new placements and one had been successfully returned to his birth father. Eight of these children had ended up with very negative endings to their placements and they weren't in a stable placement. The researchers looked at a whole area, but they looked at particularly the notion of a secure base. They looked at social functioning outside the family, so friends, school, clubs, and they looked at a sense of permanence within the family. 60% had made good progress. About a third the progress was uncertain and 13% were in what was called a downward spiral. So the good progress group, these children had shown an increased ability to make use of their foster care as a secure base. And what seemed to be a key factor was the caregivers, the foster carers sensitivity towards the child. Now sensitive parents aren't necessarily soft parents in the sense that they give in to the children all the time, it's more that they show an ability to really recognise children's emotional cues and respond appropriately. The foster carers in this group of children with a good outcome also had a very good social network around them themselves. 
and they also had regular and reliable contact from the child social worker. So just say a little bit more about sensitive parents and, and, and what we mean by this. So, so there's something about the fit between the child and the, and, and the foster parent. There's something about how the foster parent's style of interaction works for the, for the child. There's also a sense that these uh, foster carers, where there's a good fit with the foster child, somehow kind of learn how to attune to their child. So they may not have had this child with them you know, since they were born, but they learn how to adapt their style of interacting, their style of caring to the individual child. They also found that it was foster carers who really encouraged the child to have a good network of friendships and relationships outside the family that was linked to good outcome. And they also acted as an advocate for, for the child. They really promoted the child's interests, they promoted the child's strengths. And finally, they gave the child a sense that they actually, although they were a foster child, they were a permanent member of the family. And I think it's these elements that, that convey a sense of belonging to the child. This is a piece of text from the study that I've used just to give you a bit of a sense of context for the study. These more sensitive foster carers were able to convey a strong sense of their availability to meet the child's needs, both in the present and into the future. They could think about what was happening in the mind of the child and reflect this back to the child. They could provide a cognitive scaffolding to help children make sense of and manage difficult past and present experiences. They could convey unconditional acceptance of the child's difficulties as well as their strengths, accepting the child also in terms of their birth, family histories, gender, ethnicity and disability. Additionally, they could provide opportunities for assertiveness, autonomous thinking and cooperative behaviour, important for all children, but especially important for children who have been stigmatised or have felt powerless in the care system. These carers are also sensitive to the child's need to feel part of the family and so ensured that he or she was included socially and personally as a full family member. In this climate of sensitive and predictable care, there was evidence that children were less anxious, more able to think, explore, manage affect and behaviour and learn and develop. I'd like to go on to think a bit about resilience with another vulnerable group, that's children who are from war-torn countries. This comes from a study called the International Family Adult Child Enhancement Services Study, or FACES. But I'd also like to talk a bit more anecdotally about another service that I'm aware of in London, they're called the Baobab Service. So the FACES study, um, this involves 97 children who on average had had 4.5 traumatic events. And, and I think when we're talking about traumatic events, these are, these are very significantly traumatic events, such as the death of a parent or witnessing um, many people being killed or siblings being killed. And they came from 32 different countries and spoke 26 different languages. The staff themselves from the project were also refugees and spoke amongst them 15 different languages. And this study used a lot of different kinds of interventions or so-called multimodal interventions. So there was some individual work, there was family work, there was case management and consultation. So a whole variety of different interventions. One of the key features of the study was that they made a very conscious attempt to link through to the child's community and to their ethnic group. I'd like to talk a bit about the Baobab service, which is a therapeutic community in the community for young people who've survived both direct and indirect violence and, and severe breakdowns in, in care. And these are children who come from 23 different countries. Many have been child soldiers themselves, and many of them experience both rape and sexual violence, both as victims and as perpetrators of sexual violence. The Baobab service has a number of key aims. One is to promote a sense of belonging, so they, they deliberately organise the service so that the children feel they're part of something. There's an opportunity to think and reflect, there's an opportunity to develop a sense of agency by being part of this community. There's an intention to try and create a sense of tolerance and acceptance of others, and also to develop a sense of creativity, all within a community setting. Baobab provides very comprehensive, holistic assessments. Uh, there are weekly community meetings which bring everybody together, and then there are separate individual groups, separate groups of children, adolescents, and, and individual psychotherapy. Thinking about some of the key themes that have emerged in the work with the Baobab, one of the things I think is very important is about promoting the sense of belonging with other children who have also had refugee experiences and also come from war-torn areas. 
but also a sense of belonging to the community of Baobab, but also to the surrounding community and to the children's local community, and providing an opportunity to recognise and explore and try and sort of resolve some inherent dis tensions within this, because there are a whole range of very different experiences that are held within the community. So finally, just want to move on to think a little bit about um, belonging in therapy, um, and also maybe where belonging sits in the 21st century, and particularly in relation to social media. Hart and Blinko talk about the need to find somewhere for the child to belong, to tap into the good influence in the child's life, to keep relationships going, and to keep the healthiest relationships going as far as possible. At the same time, they should learn how to take from relationships where there is hope in that relationship. The Hart and Blinko talk about belonging as having two facets, really. One which is about responsibilities and another which is about obligations. And they focus on good times and good places, trying to help children develop a sense of resilience. The sense of belonging can also help the child make a sense of where they come from, and it can help them expect good experiences in the, in the future. I want to end up by just talking a little bit about belonging in the social media. This is anecdotal, but I, I suppose thinking about parents, it seems to me that the things like Mumsnet which have become a very important part of helping parents have a sense of belonging to, to a group. For children who've got specific conditions, uh, which set them apart from other children, I think that gives opportunities for parents and for children to feel, again, they're part of a, of a community. Certainly, some of the young people I work with, um, young people who self-harm and who have eating problems, have found ways of being part of healthier communities and belonging to healthier communities through things like Instagram recovery groups. And there is a sense that um, social media can act to enhance a sense of relationship, a sense of belonging within face-to-face -face relationships. And there's one study that suggested that certainly amongst students, belonging to, to developing social media relationships enhances a sense of belonging within that particular context. So it seems to me that, that belonging is a, a, a core component of resilience. Um, I think that when we think about our life in the 21st century, particularly in relation to social media, it's possible to see that some aspects of social media mitigate against a sense of belonging, but on the other hand, some aspects of social media really support it and encourage a sense of belonging. And, and we need to think about that in terms of how we relate to young people and also particularly to our patients. And finally, I wonder whether or not a sense of belonging is an under-recognised part of the therapeutic interventions that we deliver and maybe that we need to think a little bit more about how we can pay attention to belonging as a key component of therapy. Thank you.